It is now my pleasure to welcome Richard Edelman, Chief Executive Officer of Edelman, and Mina Al Arabi, Editor in Chief of the National, to share their insights on governments building trust in their nations for a strong national sense of solidarity and hope. Hello, and welcome to this World Government S Summit session entitled Embedding Trust and Authenticity in the Next Generation of Leaders. I'm Mina Al Arabi, Editor in Chief of The National in Abu Dhabi, and I'm delighted to be uh, chairing this session and conversation with a man who knows a lot about trust. Um, we are delighted to have Mr. Richard Edelman, President and CEO of Edelman to share insights on how governments can build trust and a sense of solidarity at these strange times. Of course, 2020 was a year of extremes. The pandemic brought out the best and some of the worst in societies and systems. Anxiety rose amongst most people, concern about uncertain futures, be it in work, be it in health, be it in society. Uh, for us as journalists, we were thinking about information hygiene and who do people actually trust uh, the 21st annual Edelman Trust Barometer came out earlier this year, looking at trust in 28 different countries um, with 33,000 respondents. And it's fascinating. If you haven't seen it, I urge you to see it. And I'm sure, Richard, you'll tell us about some of the findings um, that you found. But what was interested was that what was interesting to see was that government was seen globally as most trusted in May 2020 when they were reacting to the pandemic. But then they lost the lead six months later. And so it's also an indication that trust in governments and how citizens view their governments could peak, but can also come down. Um, interestingly, also from the Edelman Trust Barometer, we see that trust in businesses rose, and that will be something really to look at. But above all, there are fears about jobs and the fear of inequality rising, 62% of people concerned about that. So Richard, welcome. Um, and thank you for the Edelman Trust Barometer, because as ever, it educates us. So I wanted to ask you, how can governments promote cohesion and promote trust at difficult times like the ones we're living through now? So the big issue for government is competence. And competence is a word that um, has to do with delivering on your promises, making sure that uh, there are good outcomes uh, and that there's fairness. And so the governments in the Middle East actually did relatively well um, comparatively, in part because you've had more success in managing COVID. Um, it's a direct line to the um, low trust in governments in the UK and the US, et cetera, and very high trust in the government in China um, and Saudi and, and uh, the UAE. So. Look, there are two big lines that matter. One is competence and the other is ethical behavior. And business globally is both ethical and competent. Its scores particularly rose on ethical behavior this year because of the delivery of the vaccine and of getting people back to work. Uh, where governments fell down in Europe and, and in the US, um, governments are seen as incompetent, um, overly politicized and unable to deliver help. So. That's the challenge for government, to be seen as transparent, uh, keep your promises, and be consistent above all. You know, when two thirds of the people in the world say that their leaders are liars, that's a really scary place to be. And I use one famous word, hydroxychloroquine, which was a drug that for about three weeks was gonna save us all from COVID, and then turned out to be not useful at all. So people went, wait a minute, are, are they telling us the truth? And then we also have the problem, Mina, of people believing that the platforms, the, the media, is politicized, that it's biased, it only delivers that which it, uh, you know, um, is oriented to the left or to the right, and we have thought bubbles and people only read what they, they agree with. So, you know, we're a bit in a mess in terms of quality of information. And you know, it's interesting what you say because it is about competence, but also ethical behavior. And so given past experiences, what examples would you say, well, this is a time when you saw 
those that nexus of competence and um, ethical behavior coming together? And what can leaders learn from that? Actually, government peaked in terms of trust right after the Great Recession in 2009, 2010. It was seen as, okay, we have a huge problem. We're going to bail out the car industry or the banks or like this. Um, we're also going to make sure that, um, you know, business is regulated uh, in, a, in a fair way and that they don't do it again. And that was the high point for government. And then we saw the impasse in Brussels over the Greek debt. And then we saw the problems coming in Washington. And it was just like watching a car crash slowly. And, and so, um, again, it's a deep, interesting contrast between the developing world where governments are basically highly trusted and the developed world where government is, 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 is at its low point. Um, so, yes, it's tied to economic growth. Absolutely. But it's also um, do we keep our promises? And, you know, I was in the western part of China doing a hiking trip in, in Leaping Tiger Gorge, of all places, way out in the boondocks. And, you know, I talked to the people and they said, we trust the government. I said, why? Well, because they delivered Internet to us. And I saw these wires strung on, on poles into this far, far place where there were more pigs than there were people. And I thought, whoa, that's impressive. And but. You know, one of the things we were talking about is that trust can can also come down after there is a sense of, okay, things have gone well, but then there are hurdles along the road. So how can governments plan for those moments when actually trust can dip? What can they do to prepare people, especially in uncertain times when things change unexpectedly? So I think that uh, government is at the moment really in a place where it's, it, of course, it's a deeply divided society. I'm in the place in America where it's the most divided, um, almost 50-50 in terms of people's attitudes. But there are some problems that we have to agree on. Example, upskilling. You know, there's going to be automation. We see this coming in the next five to 10 years in retailing and in financial services, insurance. So how are we gonna train the people? That's partly a business issue. It's partly a government issue, community colleges, all this. Also, there are clear uh, mandates for um, how are we going to regulate um, social platforms in the future? You know, what about privacy, security? Um, again, these are all obvious issues that we need to, as governments, um, demand performance and, and not wait till the last minute and not be seen for example, on the pandemic is always struggling from behind. Of course, this is a magnitude of crisis that nobody ever expected. But to make sure that people get vaccinated, to make sure that people get quality information to decide to get vaccinated, all of these are jobs for government. The, the idea of a need to know and a right to know is, is quite an interesting one because there is an importance in sharing information, but sometimes you can also overshare when things are not completely clear and that creates confusion and then people say, oh, they don't know what they're doing. So how do you balance, if you're a government official, that that need to know and that right to know element? So this is a fundamental point in any sort of crisis management. I believe in constant updates. And even if you don't know, say, here's what I do know, here's my path to knowing the rest, and I'm gonna tell you every day so that you're updated. In the moment, the first problem is that experiences are driving social media, and that is seen as truth. And in fact, any individual experience could be completely off of the more normalized experience. But if it suits somebody's um, sort of meme, then it becomes truth because it gets repeated and repeated. So the best example of how good information should be delivered, quality information is what happened in America, especially in New York State, during the COVID first couple of weeks, because the governor was on every day and you could predict it like clockwork, 6 p.m., brief the media, and in the eight in the morning, brief the media. Here's what we know. Here's how many people are sick. Here's how many people are dead. Here's, here's what we have in terms of drugs. And, and kill people with information, give them more. <laughs> don't, don't deprive them because otherwise they'll make it up. That's the problem. Nobody likes a void. Give them the quality stuff 
as you can do it, but don't allow there to be a void. What other lessons would you take away from 2020? What are some of the learnings we should take with us going 2021 and what should we leave behind? So I'm very concerned about the mass class divide in the world. Um, I think that uh, this idea that the mass people have a different view than the elite people who read media a lot and have more income and come from college or grad school educated. You know, the mass population sees clearly that the incomes of the elite are going up because the stock market is up and and and, and yet their their average income isn't going up at all and they kind of go well that's not fair um, and so and also the differential outcomes for poor people uh, who are frontline workers or um, minority groups is three to one worse in the US um, versus uh, white people uh, in terms of death rates and sickness that's just indicative of a very un intolerable kind of uh, status. So th that's one thing we've learned from 2020. Another is I really believe deeply that we have to get media back to being more fact-based and less opinion-based. I really think that the extent of the business model of let's be a little more opinionated, let's get a little more social lift, Let's then, um, you know, get our numbers up in terms of circulation. That's a bad model for society. It might be good for the investors, but it's really bad for society. And you journalists have such a privileged position in the world where um, we depend on you <laughs> for, for, for a functioning society. So those are my two big takeaways. Um, can I pick up on this information element? Because it was very interesting to see the UN declaring an infodemic along by the epidemic. And as you said, there is sensationalism, there is clickbait, so to speak, that brings revenues. But at the same time, there really was a, an understanding from governments, from the UN, from the World Health Organization, that they needed to be out there with information. So how can that relationship between governments and uh, journalists be more cordial, let's say, especially in places of the world where, you know, in Europe, in the U.S., the usual um, uh, the usual format is actually to be butting heads more. I don't need to have it be cordial. I just need it to be where um, government and business feel responsible for giving you accurate and timely information so that I understand that there are certain things that government can't say yet because they don't know. Um, but in as much as the world is now expecting a faster twitch uh, kind of, of uh, information reporting and that you are no longer just doing the newspaper in the, in the morning at 24 hour cycle, you actually are doing a minute by minute cycle. As soon as you have a story, you're gonna put up what you know. That means that we have to be different in terms of the other side and giving you what we know as we know it. And also, CEOs are not the ones who should be speaking all the time. You should have technical experts who really know the subject so that a journalist can get the nuance of the science, for example, um, so that that person is more credible. And that's a big change for companies. Tell them both sides, don't just tell them the positives. This is a new level of, of, of fact and, and honesty. People respect that. Um, and also, Mina, really important, the employees become the most important audience for business. Let's talk to our own people first so that they can then spread quality information. Because with the numbers of journalists diminished around the world, we now have a vacuum. So employees in a certain way, the so-called peer-to-peer trust um, is, is really important. I want to take back, uh, take us back to the part in the conversation when you said there's a real problem of inequality and the concern that this becomes greater. How can trust in governments help to elevate some of those concerns about the, the disparity between different people of the same society? Well, I would hope that government is a big part of the fix of the problem, whether it's through taxation or um, training or um, even um, giving people the uh, chance to um, have uh, loans or something to go to school. 
it, it's government has an urgent need to show fairness in society. And a fair society means that everyone has a chance to get ahead, not just the wealthy people. And look, at I'm, I'm a moderate person politically. I'm not left. I'm not right. I'm right in the middle. Um, and so I, I really want government to put that on agenda one, um, which is we need people all over every level of economic to feel like they can get ahead. And, and that kind of middle ground at a time when we're going through economic or health crises is really important because, as you said, it's creating that common ground that it's the benefit of everybody if we can work through these problems. So how do you get governments to cooperate with each other and say that middle ground also internationally is important? So, Mia, look, in the world right now, we're operating like if you're a runner, you don't want to be looking backwards. <laughs> You want to look forward. Everybody's afraid. They're afraid of job loss. They're afraid of downward economic mobility. They're afraid of COVID. They're afraid of issues of sustainability. Let's do the Paris Accords. Let's make sure that we reduce CO2 emissions. Let's also be clear on training and on living wages and on being somehow um, employ treatment of employees. These are all areas in which um, all these countries can cooperate and look as if they're working together towards a common goal. There can be differences of opinion about Iran or, you know, whatever other issues in the world. But in the moment, um, let's let's knit the fabric together. And I think business um, has to be part of this as well and take on some part of the responsibility. Government can't do it by themselves, certainly not at the trust levels that they are. In, in, you know, in our study, we find that you know, government is 50 points lower than business incompetence. That's a huge gap. <laughs> so let business get on with things that they can do. Now, when we look at, for example, collaboration, cooperation, we also have competition on the other side, uh, particularly when we looked at, for example, vaccine development. There is a competition between companies, but then it's up to governments to make sure that delivery is ensured for, for everybody. So how do we get that uh, competitiveness to actually serve the greater good rather than seeing some barriers come up or seeing some of that competitiveness harm the, the efforts to get, for example, vaccines out there? Well, I thought in addition in May to the incredible rise in trust in uh, government, it was shocking to me that uh, the pharmaceutical industry became the most trusted industry for the first time ahead of the tech industry. Also note that just like an A-frame house, um, trust in pharma went down <laughs> by December. Um, but the reality is we were all deeply indebted to pharma for getting vaccines, also for cooperating on offering excess manufacturing capability you know, in Germany, for instance, Bayer Corporation is saying we're going to manufacture the Pfizer uh, vaccine. That's perfect. It's exactly what we need to be doing. And that's the expectation of the world. Protect us. Save us. Don't be so focused on short term profits. You have a bigger responsibility, which is that we all have a good society and good outcomes. So, Richard, for those who might be listening to us who are in government or and can influence government, um, as we wrap up this session, what would you say are the three pieces of advice you'd give them um, navigating this uncertain world that we're living in? So, um, as a little kid, I was very interested in going into government. Instead, I went in my family business, which is a great choice. But um, I wrote to Senator Bobby Kennedy, and he wrote me back. And he said, you know, government service is the greatest um, ambition that a uh, young person can have. So I still feel that way. We need to get our best and brightest to go into government, as they do in the UAE, uh, more than they do in the U.S. at the moment. But my three points of advice for government. One, take seriously this idea of cooperating with business, that, that let business do more than they have done before. Give them a playing field, but make them responsible. Two. Let's take on the important issues of the time, sustainability, living wages, upskilling, systemic racism. All of these need to be dealt with 
And then the third is, let's have a new level of cooperation and openness with the media. Um, and you should be your own media company as government, tell people what you see, but also just speak directly to the national and other media because we have to improve their ability to tell stories in a quality way. Thank you so much, Richard. As ever, insightful to speak to you. Um, you know, at these times, the, the, the element of, of true important to help ease people's anxieties, but also forge a way forward. Thank you, and thank you to the World Government Summit for giving us this opportunity. Thanks, Mina. See you at the next summit. Inshallah. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Mina, for such an insightful discussion on the importance of the values of trust and authenticity in the building of nations.